this is a great time to be new with us. Uh, January, uh, we are in this series called Enjoy Habits to Make You Happy in Him. And uh, again, if this is your first or one of your first Sundays uh, here, this is great because w- you're really being exposed to uh, content that for us is kind of the heartbeat. It's kind of the centerpiece of uh, what we see as our priority as a church. Uh, and that is uh, that word right there, enjoy. The enjoyment of Jesus for us is everything. You're going to hear it a, a ton from the pulpit, in our small groups, in our songs. You're going to hear it uh, a lot. It is not just a cool catchphrase for us. It is what we believe, the, the center piece of the Bible it, it, we believe that the, the focus of all of life is that idea, the enjoyment of Jesus. Now, I'm not a dumb dumb. I know uh, I've run with Christians long enough to know that's not how most Christians and religious folks talk about this thing, right? It, we don't typically, when we, when we say, put, put one word to the Christian religion, the Christian faith, that's that's not typically the word that's coming up. There's, there's other words that we apply. I talked to a guy a couple months ago. He found out I was a pastor, and then he was trying to do the, hey, I'm, I'm on your team kind of thing. Uh, and uh, he goes, I'm a Christian. I was like, okay. He said, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm more of an Old Testament Christian. I was like, I don't, sir, I don't know what that means. That's a very weird, weird thing for you to say. And he said, you know, like the Baptists. <laughs> what is, I don't know if you got Baptist roots in here. You're just, you know, rocking with Moses, but... I don't know. I don't know what it means. But I think after talking to him a little bit more, I think what he meant was, hey, let me tell you what camp I'm in. I'm a rules guy. I take this thing seriously, right? I, I, uh, I, there's, there's stuff to do in this book. And if our society did the stuff in the book, we'd be better off for it. So, so, so the word that comes to mind when I think about Christianity is morality, right? That, that, that's what this thing's all about. And w- there is some truth to that. If you do the things in the book, life goes better. That, that is true, but that's not what's at the core of this thing, right? That's not what is at bedrock in this thing we call Christianity. Because when, when you really kind of slow down the tape and watch frame for frame the, the Bible unfold, you're seeing shot through the whole Bible is just this language of satisfaction and God portraying himself like that. It's so interesting to me. I've said it before, but you come to a moment like Jeremiah uh, where where Jeremiah is kind of summarizing Israel's offenses to him. And he could say anything about it, but what he says is, you've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. He could have said anything and he could have said anything about himself, but he calls himself a spring of water. I'm like fresh water for you and you don't want to drink. And then you come to the New Testament. And Jesus starts picking up that language and he calls himself things like living water and new wine. And John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. He grabs all this food and drink language and and, and God is doing that in the Old Testament. Jesus is doing that in the New Testament. You go, what's that about? It's because when God, when God wants you to think about him, he wants you to think about him like this. You're like a cool drink of water to me. You, you are meant to satisfy my, my deepest longings. You're meant to awaken my spiritual taste buds. You're meant to quench my soul's thirst. That's how you ought to think about this thing we call Christianity and this person we call God. We, that is who he is and that is what he's accomplishing in us. He's, he is intending for you to enjoy him. That's what this thing is. And that's why we're doing this series, because we want to do everything we can to satisfy our heart in God. So we've been setting over the past few weeks these habits and patterns and behaviors and and lifestyle choices in front of ourselves to say, hey, if you walk in these ways, you'll thrive. You'll be able to enjoy Jesus better. And that's the point of life. So we want you to do that. So we've been looking at things like Bible reading. We've been looking at things like prayer. Next week, we're going to be talking about the importance of the gathered church. All of these things are, are, are rhythms, rituals, habits, behaviors, and practices that are meant to awaken in you enjoyment in Jesus. But now there's a flip side to that coin right? Uh, because if that's, if that's true that there are rhythms and habits and patterns and behaviors that, that can awaken joy in Jesus, the other side of that coin is there are rhythms and patterns and habits and behaviors that can kill that joy, that can squelch that joy, that can rid you of that joy in Jesus. And, and that's what we're dealing with 
today, uh, I want to think with you about one massive category of things that is killing our joy in Jesus and then to strategize with you about how to kill it. And the thing that, that the one massive thing that, it, that is doing that in us is sexual sin. Sexual sin, that's, that's the framework this morning. Now, let me just say this to start. I, I need to get this out of the way. God is not anti-sex. He is not, okay, settle down. <laughs> he is not anti-sex. He invented it. You don't invent it and then hate it. He, he made it up. He gave it to us. There's a whole book in your Bible about it. All the teenagers in here are like, what, what page is that? What is that? That's in here? He, 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 he came up with the thing, right? But he gives that good gift of sex to us in a context, right? And it's in that context he's meant for it to operate, in the context of a committed covenant of marriage between a man and a woman for life. You put sex in that context or with those borders, it can come alive for you. It could really come alive for you. You take it out of that context, out of sight of those borders, and it will kill you. It's that dangerous. It's like a fire. You've heard that analogy, right? That sex is like a fire. You, fire in my fireplace means warmth for me and my family. It means uh, coming around during Christmas time. It means roasting marshmallows. Fire in my bathroom means I buy a new house, right? <laughs> That's what it means. You, you, in its context, it works. You take it out of the context, it will kill you, right? The, it's, a, it's a very sacred and important and beautiful thing, and it works with the borders, and that's what sexual sin is. It is sex outside of its context. And, and so we could talk about the, the, the expressions of this sexual sin in all kinds of ways. Like we can, we can get there uh, this morning talking about it in all kinds of directions. We could talk about sort of the rampant sort of premarital sex that's, that uh, is statistically happening. Um, right now we could talk about it in terms of adultery. I don't know if you know this, uh, datingadvisor.com recently just put out a survey that they did of the most unfaithful cities in America in terms terms of marriages. So the, the, the cities with the most amount of adultery statistically happening uh, of, of all cities in the U.S. They did a poll of all cities, 400 million people, United States, all the cities in the United States, you know what the number one city for adultery is in the United States? Dallas, Texas. Do you know what number two is? Fort Worth, Texas. Number three, Houston, Texas. So don't think that it's somewhere out there. It's here. Sexual sin is here. It's, it's, it's right with us. So we talk about it in so many categories, but I think w the, one of the categories that, th the one I think that looms largest, that probably touches the most lives I in our space, uh, the gateway drug for so much uh, sexual deviance in our culture, that, that uh, category is gonna be the category of pornography. And that's kind of gonna be for us the bullseye this morning that we're gonna uh, look at. Uh, th this sermon can apply to any sexual sin, but we're gonna focus it right there. And we're going to talk about it in terms of pornography. Pornography, you see, you know, this, it is a rampant thing. Every day in America, 40 million Americans are regularly visiting porn sites. Uh, in 2006, uh, there was an analysis done uh, that found that adult content is the number one most searched for thing on Google. Number one. One out of every five searches on Google is for porn. 35% of every single thing downloaded on the internet, everything downloaded is pornography, 35%. Uh, the average age of first exposure, depending on the stat you look at, is between 11 and, in tw and 12 years old. Uh, for some of you, it's much younger than that. For me, it was nine years old, first uh, age of exposure to pornography. Um, in terms of teens, three out of four teens uh, have consumed pornography or are consuming pornography. I actually, this is self-reporting. I actually think that number's a lot higher than that. No teens eager to raise their hand and just say, yep, count me in on that. It's three, three out of four teens are engaging with pornography. In 2014, uh, uh, Bar Barna did a study, and this is what they found. Uh, for no non-Christian men in the U.S., 65% of all non-Christian men in the U.S. use porn at least once a month. So every man in the U.S. who's not a Christian looks at porn at least once a month, 65%. Do you know what that number is for Christian men? 64%. It's not out there. It's here. 
See that? It's, it's here. One out of every five student pastors, one out of every seven lead pastors is regularly looking at pornography. That's over 50,000 U.S. church leaders. It is out there and it is here. And you know it's here. There's a lot of people in this room. There's a lot of people in this church. And we're struggling. I'm, I'm one of your pastors. I know we're struggling. And I know firsthand, because many of you have known my story, I've, I've dealt with a decade of pornography addiction in my past. And many of you are right in the thick of it right now. Or, or fill in the blank of sexual sin. But I'm just saying, if these stats are true, then it's here. And so we need to deal with it, because it's killing us. It's a tragedy. Now, why is it a tragedy? Why can I talk about it in terms of a tragedy? What would we point to to say it's tragic? Well, there's a lot of ways to talk about that, right? We could talk about it in terms of, I, I could give you statistics about how, how sexual sin damages the family unit, about how porn increases marital infidelity by 300%, 300%. That, that the people who look at porn report uh, higher rates of loneliness than people who don't. That they are 22% more likely to commit a sexual offense in their lifetime. We could talk about the, the fact that pornography use perpetuates the, the exploitation in particular of women in the sex industry who are functionally held hostages as, as slaves of this industry over time. We could talk about how, how pornography use trains us to start seeing one another like products instead of people or commodities to be consumed instead of image bearers of the living God. We could talk about all that, all that is tragic, but that's not the main reason that pornography and sexual sin is tragic. That's not the main reason. The main reason it's tragic is because it tells a lie that God doesn't satisfy. That's why it's tragic. Especially for the Christian church because it tells a lie to our heart and to the watching world that he says he's enough, but I don't think so. He says he's the fountain of living waters, but I'm going to that well, the broken well, and I'm drinking from it because I don't believe it. That's the tragedy of porn. It tells a lie about our God that he cannot satisfy us. And I don't want to tell that lie. And I don't want us to be a people who lie. I want with our lives to tell the truth about the living God. I want my kids to know dad doesn't look at porn because Jesus satisfies the deepest parts of his heart. I want my neighbor to, to know I'm not sleeping around on my wife, man, because I love him. I love God. I, I enjoy Jesus. I want, I want Stonegate to, to say like we always say, we enjoy Jesus. We make disciples. That's what we're about. And then I want us to go home and prove it. Otherwise, it's just words. And it's a waste of time. And I don't want to waste time. And I don't think you do either. I, I don't want us to lie anymore about it. We got to get serious about it. This is a real thing. And we're not talking enough about it. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to deal with it. I want us to look at maybe the, the single best chapter on enjoying God in the whole Bible, in my opinion, anyways. Psalm 16. And what we're going to do is simple. We're just going to ask this question of the text. How do we fight for a life of sexual integrity so our heart can be happy in him? How do we fight for that? Psalm 16 is not about porn. It's not about sexual brokenness. But this psalm gets at the root of what enjoying God looks like. And so I want us to bring that question to the text so we can apply it to our lives. And what we're going to see as we work through the psalm is there is three measures that the psalmist David takes in order to keep his heart delighting in God. There's three things that we're going to see him do and, and walk in that are going to keep his affections hot for the Lord. And, and it's these. That here's the movements this morning. We're going to see that we are to flee from, flee to and flee with. That's the movement. And it's not just Psalm 16, it's really the whole Bible, but we see it here too. That we are to flee from, flee to, and flee with. Now I'll, I'll flesh that out here in a, 
second. But, but uh, if you have your Bible, get it out. We're going to be in Psalm 50, uh, 16, looking, uh, starting in verse 4. And we're going to consider this first part, part one, that, that we are to flee from sin in our effort to delight our hearts in God. For us to be happy in God, we have to run from sin. Here is verse 4. It says this. <laughs> the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. So, so the psalmist, he's looking around and he, and he notices a group of folks who he calls those who run after another God. And the, the, he, he's seeing a group of people who are worshiping what in his day were pagan gods, pagan idols. He's seeing them and he's making an observation about them. He's noticing something. And what he's noticing is that it's making life miserable for them. Their sorrows, he says, are being multiplied. One of the first steps for you and I fleeing sin is this. You need to have a clear-eyed view of the havoc sin wreaks on a human life. We have to be able to see it, name it, embrace it, understand it. We have to know what the repercussions are. And that's what David's doing. He's looking around, he's saying, you're chasing that God and it's killing it's destroying you. The sorrows of those who run after another God are being multiplied. I'm, I'm seeing this firsthand right now. I'm, I'm walking with a friend of mine who gave me permission to tell this story. Uh, and he, he, he loves Jesus. He's, he's fighting to walk with Jesus. But sin and sexual sin in particular, pornography addiction in particular, has crept in in such a way that it is destroying his life. And, and I'm texting with him and I'm getting updates and it's, it's affecting everything. It's affecting his ability to, to have the job that he had. It's affecting his dating relationships that he just can't interact with women normally anymore. It's, it's moved him to where he's engaging with prostitutes now. He actually just came out of a 12-week rehab clinic. It's costing him tens of thousands of dollars to get healing from it. One of the recent times that we were texting together, he, he told me in a text, I am sure of this, if I don't change, I will either be in prison or be dead. This is a person who loves God, Who's, who's fighting for it, but, but the, that sin has crept in and it is killing him. And I hate that story and I'm praying for him. And if he's watching, brother, I'm, I'm praying for you even today that, that you would experience so much freedom in that. But I, I want you to hear this. It is good for me to know that story. It's good for me to remember that. To, to warn myself of it. I, we need to see it and call it what it is and know that the sorrows of those who run after another God, they don't go away. Life doesn't get easier. Sin wreaks havoc. It will destroy you. It will multiply your sorrow. And so he says, after that, their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out. Now, that's a weird, we don't talk like that, but he's, he's talking about a cultic ritual, like a sacrificial ritual. And he's saying, I'm not going to to sacrifice at that altar. I'm not gonna pay, it's a way to pay homage to God. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm not bowing the knee to these joy killers, those fake gods. I'm not doing that. I'm not even gonna take their names on my lips, he says. That's a, that's a Hebrew sort of idiom to talk about making an oath. He's saying, I'm not, I'm not pledging myself to them anymore. What David's doing is he's drawing a line in the sand. He's made an observation about the chaos that, that that God wreaks in those people's lives. And he's saying, there's a line here. I'm not crossing it. I'm not going with it. I'm not flirting with that. I'm running away from it. Uh, the, war, you, the, the names of those gods won't even be on my lips. This is what it looks like to flee sin. Hard lines, boundaries, fleeing, running away from the thing that is going to steal our joy. That is what we have to do. When others run after another God, we run away. Now, this may surprise you, but stand your ground is an unbiblical way to fight sin. That is not what the Bible teaches about fighting sin. The Bible's f uh, message for fighting sin is this, run for your lives. That's, that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. 1 Timothy 6.11, but as for you, man of God, flee these things. The Bible's tip for you and sin is run. Run away. You're not strong enough. I love how, how honest the Bible is. You just can't hack it. You, you, you in the same room with that temptation will not go well. 
There's no cool trick here. You need to run in the opposite direction. If you want to be a person of sexual integrity, you cannot flirt with sin. You have to to flee. You're not strong enough. You have to run. I, I took this literally in college. When, when I was in college, and we, I was in my house by myself, and there was a moment of temptation in my bedroom to, to look at something on the internet or, or, or whatever, my habit just became this. I just got up, and I ran outside, and then I just ran around the block. It's amazing how little porn you can watch while running. It just, <laughs> it do, it's, it's really hard. But, but that was my, for me, it was like my, my method in that moment was I've got to get outside because that weird stuff doesn't typically happen when you're walking around your neighborhood and I need to be running, right? My body needs to be doing something, right? That, that was me. That was a way I, to flee the sin. But what about you? What, what boundaries are you putting in place? What rhythms are you installing to run away from your sin? Can, can I tell you something? Some of you in here, are addicted to pornography and you are wrestling with it and, and, and you hate it. And right now in your pocket is a device that connects you to every single thing the internet has to offer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Do you think it might be time for a flip phone? I'm not being cute. I'm being serious. You know, we wrote a document at Stonegate that's, that's uh, online, and you can check it out at stonegate.church forward slash freedom. I'll mention uh, this again later. Uh, and th- th- one of the things this document does is it helps turn, uh, explain how for you to turn your smartphone into a dumb phone. It walks you through the process. Uh, that is exactly the type of measure you need to take if you're wrestling with this. We have to make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. We have to run the other way. Flee youthful lust, the scripture says. What are you doing about it? What boundaries are you putting in place? Go find that article. Go take these steps. Let me me say uh, one other quick word. Let me talk to parents in the room real quick. If you're a parent in the room, with kids who have devices, uh, especially um, smartphones, iPhones, uh, a laptop, uh, iPad, that sort of thing, and you have not put protection software on that, some boundary border-like software, some reporting software on that, if you've not taken measures on those devices on your kids' devices, uh, you should just go ahead right now and assume they've either looked at porn, will look at it, or are looking at it right now. You just need to assume that. This is not the 1990s anymore. This is now, it is right. You don't even have to want to want it. It just happens sometimes. There's just a moment of clickbait or or a a sentence here that looks innocuous and you click on it and you're just something else. You have to put in roadblocks. We have to find ways to flee. Make no provision for the flesh. We have to be wise. It's the first step to freedom. We flee from our sin. But... We don't just flee from our sin, right? That's not enough because sin is not so much a deed problem. It's not just a do or don't issue. We know sin is a heart problem. It is me wanting to be satisfied and going to objects other than God for satisfaction, right? So it won't just do for me to just change this behavior because my heart wants something and I'll just find something else to replace it, right? So we need something else. Uh, St. Augustine knew this. I remember St. Augustine from the 4th and 5th century. Uh, you know, before he got saved and became like the greatest theologian in history, he was a sexual deviant. He was engaging with prostitutes. He had kids out of wedlock. He was a mess. And then he got saved and he wrote a memoir. And in his memoir, one of the lines he said, it's one of the most famous lines in Christian history now. Uh, it's this. He said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. He got it. The issue isn't s- so much that activity. The issue is I have a heart that wants something and I'm not going to the only object that can satisfy it. So I'm constantly restless, even if I leave that sin until my heart finds its rest in thee. So the movement is this, we flee from sin, but we flee to God. We don't flee to nowhere, we flee to God. That's the second part, fleeing to God. Now we do this in a couple ways and we're gonna see this here in the text. The first thing is you gotta preach to yourself. We preach to ourselves. You're going to see David do this in verse 2 and many places uh, throughout this psalm. He says this, I say to the Lord in verse 2, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. First off, did you know that? There is no good apart from the good of God. 
There is nothing, you know, in the Hebrew, if you were to translate this literally, it would read this. My good is not beyond you. If I'm looking for good and I pass up God, I've gone too far. You need to turn around and go back because God is where the good is. Satisfaction is where he is and it is not beyond him. I have no good apart from you. So uh, uh, David says this outright here, but the second thing is this. Newsflash, God already knows that. So David, who are you talking to, right? Of course, it's good to tell, tell the truth and, and to say truth in our prayers and to affirm those things before God, but God didn't learn anything in that. So what is the other function of David saying that? He's preaching to himself, isn't it? He's saying, I have, remember this heart, I have no good but God. I, th- there is nothing on earth, another psalmist will say, uh, th- that I have besides you. You are everything to me. He's preaching to himself. You have to find ways to tell yourself the truth about how God satisfies. You need to hide God's word in your heart in such a way that you tell yourself this truth when the moment comes of temptation. He's gonna do this over and over again in the Psalms. Look at uh, verse five. He says this, the Lord, he says, is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Now again, we don't talk like that. Nobody's holding anybody's lot around here. Nobody's portion and cup. But, but this, is a, this is Old Testament language. This is a, the law of Moses. He's referring back to when God apportioned all of the 12 tribes land in Canaan. And there was one tribe that didn't get any land. It was the Levites. The Levites weren't apportioned land. And God looked at the Levites and this is what he said you're not getting land because your portion isn't that. Your portion is going to be me. I am your portion. And the Levites getting the Lord as their portion was actually better than them getting the land. And David's borrowing that imagery and he's saying here, uh, it may look like I'm missing out on some things. It may look like I'm missing out on pleasure, but the reality is the portion I have is better than the land. The portion I have is the Lord. He he is my portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Is it possible you're gonna miss out on some of the pleasure the world has to offer if you flee from sin and flee to God? Yes, of course. But it will not matter if it is actually true that there is no good beyond God. God is offering himself to us to find delight. And we tell that to our hearts. We, we remind our hearts, I might not have all of this stuff. I might not be able to enter into that pleasure in that way, but it is more of a pleasure to be with God. Some of you are just gonna have to believe that on faith, but it's more of a pleasure to be with God. Verse two, verse five, and then verse 11, uh, one of the best verses in all the Bible. Memorize this verse, people. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What a promise about who God is. You know, in the Hebrew, the the word joy there where it says fullness of joy, it's actually in the plural. This only happens two times in the Old Testament to the word joy. And it's a way to emphasize something. This is a, it's kind of like the author's doing this. Uh, There is so much joy to be found in God's presence that, that it can't, I can't write it singularly. I can't say there's just one. There's the fullness of joys is how I have to talk about it because there's so much of that to be had in God's presence. When you are with God, you are at the zenith of joy. At his right hand, the text says, are pleasures forevermore. I, I say this to myself all the time in moments of temptation. Here's my rhythm. When, when I feel tempted to, to sin and stray from God, I'm always saying something like, it won't satisfy me. Only Jesus can do that. I say that multiple times a day. I come up to something, I know, uh, maybe I want to click there. Maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want, it won't satisfy me. Only Jesus can do that. Only, only Jesus can do that. Be, because the fullness of joy is only in God's presence. And that is going to take me away from his presence. We have to tell ourselves, our hearts, the truth. If we want to flee toward God. But that's not the only thing we do. It's not just enough to know some truths about God. See, we, we can't just preach to ourselves. We also have to position ourselves. And that's what we see from David in verse eight. Look at it right here. He said this, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Knowing God satisfies is not enough. 
It's important for you to know that. But knowing that simply is not enough. David makes a decision to get close. He says, hey, I can set something before me. The thing I'm choosing to set before me is the Lord. And I'm not just doing it once or twice a day. I am setting the Lord continually or always before me. Right? He's changing the object of his attention. It's not just that I have some truth that I can grab onto. It's that constantly before me, I am setting the beauty and majesty of God right here. And it's so interesting when he does that, the next thing he says is, because he's right here, because he's at my right hand, what? I shall not be shaken. There's a sturdiness that comes when you set up God in front of you. When, when it's not just some truth floating around here, but when I actually change my situation and circumstances so that the thing I am mostly gazing at is him. This, <clears throat> this happened uh, for me accidentally in college. I, uh, I went to college. We were in a house. Uh, none of us had any money, so we couldn't pay for cable. So we didn't have cable. There was no TV. We didn't watch anything. I come from a house where I was watching probably three to four hours of TV a day. Not watching pornography. I was just watching TV. Just Seinfeld. Just mostly Seinfeld. Uh, and when I got to college, I did, I, we just didn't have it. So what I, what I noticed was I was out of the living room, I was out from that TV, uh, and I was in my bedroom a lot more, and I was reading the Bible a lot more. I had more time. It turn, turns out when you're not watching four hours of TV, you got more time. So I'm there, and I'm, I'm reading. And, and I'll tell you this, it was the first time I accidentally started to get free of porn in that moment, because it was the first time in my life that, that I, I was going a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, without getting on the internet to look at whatever. And, and I was going, well, why is that? And it dawned on me, my object had changed. It, it, it wasn't that I was even deliberately saying no to pornography. It was simply that I was starting to set the Lord continually before me instead of all of the wasted time, wasted objects that I normally did. And it changed something. It, it actually gave me that kick toward freedom that I needed. So we, we, we have to tell our hearts the truth about who, uh, who God is and that he alone can satisfy it, but then we position our lives in a way that we actually believe it. That's how we flee to God. So we flee from sin and we flee to God by doing it. How are you doing with this, by the way? What is it looking like for you? I'm telling you, freedom will not come if you are not changing the objects before your face. Are you in God's word? I know it's just like a dead horse around here. We talk about it all the time, prayer and God's word and being with God's, I'm t uh, the reason we say it so much is because that, that's what the Bible says. You have to be in his, you have to be hearing his promises. You have to be studying his character. You have to be treasuring the virtue of him and the beauty of him. You set him before you, something's gonna start changing in you as you run from sin and you start setting the beauty of God before you, you're gonna change. It's gonna happen. But it will not happen if just those two pieces are there. Because the text tells us one more thing. It's not just enough to flee sin. That is great. It's not just enough even to flee sin by going to the Lord. Yes, we need that. Yes, everything I just said. But we also have to flee with community. We have to do that in the context of other believers. Let me show you what I mean. It's, it's interesting. Here, there, there are two groups of people named in this psalm. The first group we, we met a little earlier, they were the ones that he called those who run after another god, right? And that group of people, uh, David says, hey, their path is folly. Uh, I, I don't run with them, right? That, that's not his crew. He doesn't go with them. But he does have a crew, and it shows up in verse 3. His crew is this. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. For you to fight sexual sin, you need a change in community. The community, who you run with, has everything to do with your sexual integrity. Everything to do with it. It, it will not change without this. You need the saints. In the text, he calls them the excellent ones. In, in the Hebrew, that word uh, it can be translated either excellent or noble or magnificent or majestic. You run with any majestic folks? You ever walk into a room with a group of folks? They're like, those people are majestic, Right? That's who you need in your life. Folks who are noble, folks who have character, folks who love God and love you and they really do fight sin. You need a tribe of people with you who you can say they're the excellent 
ones in whom is all my delight. For me, th- this started in high school. As my youth pastor grabbed me, started discipling me, walking me through the word, I got to watch him walk with Jesus and I started walking in his footsteps. I got to college, my roommates became my accountability partners. We started fighting sin together. We started praying together as a household. We went out and evangelized and we'd come back and we'd celebrate together. They, I had a group of people now that I could link arms with and fight sin together. I, the, we could fight for treasuring God together and it changed everything thing for me. Joy in God, it's a community project. You can't, you cannot just be a Christian on an island. You cannot keep your sin struggle to yourself and say, I'm going to read my Bible all day and I'll get free. You, it will not happen. The, the, the Bible tells you it will not. Second Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. There's the pursue God part of it. Along with others who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We flee from, we flee to, and we flee with, or you don't flee. There is no freedom apart from the people of God. Grab those excellent ones, those majestic ones, and run with them. And look, it's hard. Here's what this means. It means you're going to have to open up your life. Sexual sin is shameful. We don't like to talk about it. It's embarrassing. Oh, I can't control my own body. It's, emba- it's, sh- it's a shameful thing, but you won't find freedom if you don't open your mouth and raise your hand and say, I need help. We're gonna help you with this. We created an email address just for you. It's uh, freedom at stonegate.church. If you, if you just want to take a baby step in that direction, you can email that email address. It's only going to two of our pastors in our church. And, and it's just a way for you to raise your hand and say, I need help. Can you plug me into a group that, that's fighting? I, I want that. Would you have the courage? Would you have the humility? Would you have the desire to be holy enough to email today, if that's you? Freedom at stonegate.church. We want to resource you. We, we want you to go to stonegate.church forward slash freedom. We have a ton of resources and articles and that's where you can find individual groups that are dealing with this very issue that you can partner with, run beside, and that you can fight for joy in God together. We want to equip you for it. Listen, this is the way to get free. I mean, please take it from me. It's been 18 years since the last time I engaged with pornography. And that was a 10-year addiction for me. And that's not a go Jimmy story. That's the grace of God using the means of God, fleeing from sin, realizing it's broken, fleeing to Jesus, realizing he satisfies, and doing that with a group of people who loved me enough to hold me accountable and point me to him. It's the only way you will find freedom. And we want to help you in it. So take advantage of the resources and let's be free to enjoy Jesus together. Yeah? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we give you thanks for uh, the promises that you've given us in the word that joy is not found beyond God, that pleasure is not found beyond God, that, that good is not found beyond you. And so God, keep us close. Keep us right by you. We need you. We need to be satisfied in the Son of God. Help us to run away from those lesser loves, but from those fiction saviors, from those promise breakers, and help us to run to the only one, the one who our hearts were designed to enjoy, and help us to have enough courage to open up to people in this church, maybe for the first time for some of us in here, maybe for the first time trusting in Jesus to satisfy for the first time in here. I pray that you would break the chains of addiction and strongholds right now for someone in this room, that they would cast themselves on the Lord Jesus and his death as a substitute on their behalf for the first time so they'd be free and have your Holy Spirit and be able to walk in victory. God, would you do that? And as we sing, God, give us light hearts so that we can really enjoy you together as a family. In Jesus' name, amen.